I'll be talking today about air pollution and climate consequences from uh, different types of energy strategies in the United States. Overall, I'm really passionate about thinking about sustainable energy systems. Really, the goal uh, of, of my research efforts is to try to understand both the engineering and economic feasibility of low carbon, sustainable, affordable, and soci socially just energy systems, looking both at the supply and demand side of energy services. Um, but of course, we can't make those decisions without thinking about the policy context. So a second stream of work really deals with the most um, effective ways of design policies, but also trying to understand whether the policies that we have in place are achieving the intended goals. And finally, to make all of this work towards sustainable energy systems, we need people. Um, and so I'm also quite passionate about understanding how people use and select technologies and their perceptions towards energy use. The work that I'll present today was done in collaboration with several folks, and I'll, I'll tell a little bit more about that as I present the papers, but it is the result of three recent um, research efforts. So the first one is looking at uh, the damages in the US economy from PM 2.5 emissions and relating that with the economic activities themselves. The question really being, uh, how do we compare the health damages imposed uh, from pollution to the value that is being provided by those uses and services. So this is work that has been done in collaboration with Peter Chofen, a PhD student in engineering and public policy, and Nick Mueller, uh, an economist at Carnegie Mellon University. So for a broader context, uh, PM 2.5 is the largest environmental health risk in the US and globally. PM 2.5 is associated with increased mortality rates from cardiovascular diseases uh, and other uh, diseases and consequences. Um, and we have two sources of PM, both the direct uh, PM formation from fuel combustion, but also the formation of secondary PM from SO2, NOx, uh, that can react with ammonia, uh, and that's actually the largest source of health damages. Of course, we're happy to benefit from the energy services and other services provided in the economy. It is increasing our quality of life and some of those services are really needed. But we also have this effect that is not taken into account in the economy re regarding the premature mortality. Air pollution still today continues to be a major contribution to premature mortality in the United States. The global burden of disease reports that it's the ninth largest risk factor and contributes to more than 100,000 fatalities in the United States. Um, and uh, the study suggests that there's really not a safe level for several local air pollutants, including PM 2.5, um, which the EPA uh, estimates is responsible for 90% of all pollution-related death. So the questions that we address in this first paper are um, how have the effects from air pollution in the United States changed from different economic activities over time? How do the health damages compare to the value added by those same economic activities? And I'll jump to the summary of the results, then I'll explain how we got there. Um, but first, a, a little bit of good news. The emissions from mo most pollutants that result in PM 2.5 have been decreasing in the United States, but this trend has not been uniform across all sectors of the economy. In order to show that, we use integrated assessment models that compute the marginal damages for PM 2.5 related emissions in each county and match them with the damages uh, to compute the econ economy-wide gross external damages, or GED. I'll refer a lot to this GED factor, which is basically the monetary value associated with the health damages caused by PM 2.5. We find five things. The first one is that not only the emissions have decreased, but the damages, the health damages from those emissions have decreased very rapidly, 20% over the course of six years, between 2008 and 2014. Second, and a little bit more surprisingly, farms have now largest health damages than utilities on the aggregate. Not only the electricity sector, all utilities combined. Finally, there is a concentration of damages, just four sectors in the US economy, uh, which comprise less than 20% of the national GDP, account for 75% of all gross external damages. 
And a note about uncertainty. Uh, the economy is changing, and it's changing towards services uh, that are associated with uh, ground level and distributed pollution. That brings new challenges and, and data needs uh, because emissions from vehicles, for example, are often estimated rather than measured. And some services like Uber and Lyft may not be well captured in the economic accounting um, in BA. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And some policy conclusions which are that our results suggest that policymakers should consider targeting further emissions reductions if that is cost effective in transportation and in agriculture. Now, a little bit about data and methods. Uh, we use as data sources for emissions for SO2, PM2.5, NOx, VOCs, and ammonia. Uh, we also need information on mortality rates, population, matching between EPA definitions of what an industry is or a facility does with the same matching uh, by the economic accounts and just the value added by different sectors of the economy. In the modeling steps, we have two steps. The first one is to compute the marginal damages from air pollution uh, for each of the pollutants by its source for different counties. We do so using three different reduced form air quality models, AP3, Easier, and InMap. For sake of time, the main results I'll present here are the ones using AP3, one of those models. We then match the emissions and damages from uh, EPA to the ones in the economic accounts. And finally, we produce the gross external damages by year and by sector. We also show the representation of the external damages as a function of value added. A little bit about the marginal damages and how you we compute that, and in particular for um, AP3. Uh, so we simply c calculate the, the marginal damages uh, from air pollution um, by um, computing the marginal damages and multiplying by uh, that by the emissions for different types of pollutants, for different types of um, sites and uh, locations. So uh, with that, we have a gross external damage that is going to be represented in billions of dollars or millions of dollars of health damages. Now, to have the information on the marginal damages itself, we um, need to rely on an air quality model. And so what the air quality model will do is to relate the emissions, first baseline emissions, and then an incremental increase uh, in a source of a pollutant with the PM2.5 change in concentration associated with that pollutant. Now, there are two types of air quality models that are generally used in the literature and to support regulatory decisions. Uh, one are the chemical transport models, CTMs. Those are really state of science uh, models. Uh, they provide the most robust estimates on the changes of concentration to, to changes in emissions in a specific location. They are extremely time consuming, so they may be used to represent a day uh, but they become extremely difficult to use when we want to look at emissions over the course of several years in many locations and do things like Monte Carlo analysis. The reduced complexity models are much less resource intensive, less accurate than CTMs. Those are the family of models that we're using. They provide a really good flexibility in terms of sensitivity analysis, Monte Carlo approaches, and so on. Regarding the emissions, uh, we have different types of emission sources and their consequences will also be different. So we have stack emissions from power plants, they will emit mostly uh, SO2 and NOx and they'll have a very wide dispersion. Emissions from uh, industries and plants that will also emit uh, SO2 and other hazardous pollutants with medium to wide dispersion. Uh, then emissions from trucks uh, that uh, will consist primarily of NOx and that will occur at ground level and emissions from cars which are going to be centered around urban areas uh, and that once again are ground level emissions. And so the consequences for the dispersion and the uh, air pollution consequences of those emissions differ quite widely. Again, for all of those three reduced form uh, models, we need several data inputs. We need emissions by county and stack height um, and vital statistics like mortality rates and population by county and age group. And these models couple spatially resolved emissions data with the reduced form uh, complexity model to compute first baseline uh, concentrations for PM at each location. And then after that baseline um, run, the, mo the model is run again with a perturbation in emissions, thus providing the marginal effect uh, from one additional ton of pollution. 
all the three models differ in the way they are structured. So AP3 uses a source receptor matrices and uh, that are derived from Gaussian plume dispersion modeling. Um, easier is slightly more related to a CTM. Um, it's based on regressions fit out of a CTM. And the EMAP is really a temporally average uh, CTM run. So once we have the changes in PM concentration, now we get to the issue of how does this change in concentra concentration change uh, the effect of premature mortality. Uh, so we use the population data to assess the exposure of vulnerable people to pollutants. And uh, this is really not going to add. Um, and we use the demand response functions coupled with mortality rates to uh, understand the premature mortality caused by a perturbation in emissions. Uh, we rely on the literature that has been done with several court studies that relates the emissions to uh, the premature mortality from the American Cancer Society. That's one of the most widely used uh, formulation to quantify the premature death. Uh, and we do so by different population age segments and separately for each county. Now, finally, there is this um, process on moving from premature uh, deaths to uh, an economic evaluation in dollar terms. So we use, the, we use the value of mortality rate or the value of statistical life uh, using the recommended values from the EPA and adjusted for uh, each year. Now, the second uh, part of this matching is that these two groups, the EPA for the emissions reporting and the Bureau of Economic Analysis for the economic output, really don't talk to each other. So the way they list sectors, subsectors, and industries use completely different uh, listings and, and codes. So a lot of the effort was then to match one data source or to another for thousands and thousands of facilities and emission sources. Um, and there is some loss of information. For example, we can attribute almost every single source of emission to a sector because it is more aggregate, but you start losing information as we try to match it to uh, s industries or industry groups. So for power plants, there will be matching to the sector of utilities, but then we'll need to match it to uh, power generation in uh, the economic accounts and so on and so forth. Now some of the key results. So first of all, the national trends, the nationwide gross external damages associated with the produ products of and, uh, production of goods and services has decreased by more than 20%. So from $1,000 billion to $719 billion from 2008 to 2014. This is non-trivial. These damages would uh, correspond to something like 6% of GDP in 2008, and they are down to a little bit over 4% in 2014. So the good news is that uh, through 2014, the U.S. economy continues to uh, be on its path to be less pollution intensive and with less uh, lower consequences. As I mentioned earlier on, crucial to the pollution control efforts is the fact that 75% of the attributable gross external damages occurs in just four sectors of the economy, agriculture, utilities, manufacturing, and transportation. So th the figure will pop up in a little bit on the vertical axis, we have the gross external damages from air pollution. You'll see colors representing the different source pollutants. Uh, the first four plots are gonna be for agriculture, utilities, manufacturing, and transportation, the four larger sectors. And the final plot will be for all other 16 sectors combined. And we do that for 2008, uh, 2011, and 2014. That's when we have data from uh, the NEI. So a couple of key messages. Uh, we do see that all four sectors that correspond to the largest amount of damages see falling damages over this time period. Indeed, particularly noteworthy is that the utility sector gross external damages fell by more than 50% over a six year time period. Uh, this, is, this is really enormous. Um, and the utility sector's gross external damages were dominated mostly by the emissions of SO2, and so three factors play a role in this decrease. The first, uh, the use of air pollution control technologies, so scrubbers, the recent closure, closure of coal power plants, and fuel switching to natural gas. Second, by 2014, agriculture is the sector that creates the largest sectorial gross damages. 
uh, which are primarily due to livestock emissions, fertilizer and fuel burning, as well as some on combustion uh, emissions from agricultural equipment, but those are smaller. Uh, in the context of transportation, we do see a decline uh, in gross external damages, uh, thanks mostly to um, uh, a decrease in NOx emissions, which are the primary contributor jointly with PM2.5. Now, all other sectors, the other 16 sectors of the economy have the same magnitude of damages as many of the other four sectors with all the activities together. The largest contributor between those uh, 16 sectors is contr uh, construction and primary PM2.5 emissions from construction. Now, that's the dollar value of the external damages. The interesting thing now comes in comparing the damages that we're imposing on society from air pollution to the value added from those economic activities. So on the vertical axis, we have the external damages, horizontal axis, the value added. Ideally, we would like to see things to be on the lower right quadrant, things that provide the value added and that have a very low gross external damages or at the very least that are on the bottom part of the plot. So let's look at um, some, so how some of the subsectors match out. Um, and so the first um, message is that at the margin, we're seeing that the damages from air pollution provided by farms are larger than the marginal value that the farms provide in economic terms. Um, so ideally, we would like to see things moving below the um, diagonal line. But indeed, what we're seeing is that farms are increasing in terms of value added, but not really being able to reduce the amount of pollution. The good news for utilities is that um, the um, value added continues to be maintained, or at least increase a little bit, at, uh, at while being able to decrease the external damages from air pollution enormously. And finally, you do see uh, changes in the truck transportation also maintaining the value added, but having a decrease in damages and in emissions. The fact that you see for petroleum uh, products comes mostly from the fluctuation in oil prices rather than anything else. Now we can zoom in a little bit for those sectors at the industry level. And so what this table shows is this ratio of gross external damages to value added in 2008, 2011, and uh, 2014. Importantly, we see that in 2008, we had four industries that had a ratio larger than one, meaning at the margin, damages larger than the value added. Uh, by the time we're in 2011, we only have three sectors. And right now, it's only animal production and aquaculture that has damage is much larger than the value added. We also see that the types of industries that make the top five change uh, over time for the analysis. Um, finally, there is a loss of information as we try to get more granular. So we're able to match all the emissions for agriculture, but as we go to subsector industry, uh, uh, industry group, and finally industry, we lose some information where we're not able to attribute um, uh, the activities to specific crops. This is actually the next piece of work that we are um, starting right now, is really trying to understand what are the damages from um, different um, uh, industries within agriculture. A little bit on sensitivity and uh, uncertainty analysis. Uh, we know from previous work that there are two things that the results are very sensitive to. One is the value of a statistical life or value of mortality risk. And the other one is the dose response to air pollution. So one of the things we pursue is an alternative dose response function that is also used uh, in the literature as an alternative, that's Harvard six studies. And we find that actually our original estimate was fairly conservative. If we used Harvard six studies dose response function, the economy-wide economy externalities from um, air pollution damage is more than double. We also see that there are differences depending on uh, the air quality model used, and that's mostly a function of the structure of the model themselves and changes uh, in different inputs. So key, f key findings, just to reiterate, first, national trends, economy-wide GED has decreased by more than 20% in a very short amount of time. Farm damages are larger than utility damages. There is a concentration of damages in four sectors. And there are uncertainties, and those uncertainties are growing if the agencies don't start tackling the issue of the data needs for ground level and distributed emissions. 
And we do suggest that policymakers will start looking more carefully at the potential for cost-effective reductions in transportation and agri agriculture. There are three concluding considerations that I would like to leave you on, and then we'll move to the second paper. The first one is that the value added is not the only measure of a contribution of an economic activity to national output. So if a sector has some contribution in the form of a public good that is not related to air pollution, that is outside of the scope of the value added, our GED to VA ratio is gonna overestimate the pollution intensity of that output. Also, uh, I really urge caution on the interpretation of these ratios GED to VA larger than utility. This work is not advocating that we should shut down agriculture in the United States. It is providing the intuition that at the margin, the damages are larger than the value uh, provided, so we'll need to think about the sector uh, more seriously. And finally, this whole change of the US economy towards a more service base that brings new challenges on the whole environmental emissions accounting. We've looked at the US economy, and now I'm gonna do a deep dive on the electricity sector. So this is work that is gonna be, it's actually in the final stages of production right now. It will be published in es and and it is a collaboration with Manager Thing. He was a PhD student at University of uh, Washington and now is at NREL, and Chris Tessum and Julian Marshall, who are both professors at University of Washington. And the key question is, is really, do we all breathe the same air? We don't, right? The consequences of the air we breathe are tremendously different uh, across the, the nation. While the electricity sector is having less emissions uh, um, uh, in the recent years, it is still a significant contributor uh, to air pollution, specifically from coal, even if that contribution has declined for the reasons we just discussed. The existing estimates of PM2.5 mortality from the electricity sector in the United States range widely from 10,000 to 52,000 premature deaths per year. This depends on the model being used, the year of analysis, and so on. The demographic distribution of the exposure, however, is largely unknown. So this plays a role into the, new lit the literature on environmental justice. Again, we don't all breathe the same air, and the consideration of how we are exposed uh, to air pollution by different economic groups and how states influence each other is relevant. Several studies have looked at the health impact disparities from air pollution from sources in the economy on aggregate, but very few have focused and, and not to the level of detail that we're doing in electricity generation. So what you'll see in the next uh, slides, I'll talk a little bit about the methods, but I'll present the exposure and health impacts from PM2.5 uh, from electricity generation for the seven regional transmission organizations, RTOs, in the United States. For each US state, and in here we'll present the quantitative results of the damages from and to a state, and also by income and race. Now, we find that average exposures nationwide are highest uh, for people that self-identify in the census as black and African-American, followed by no, uh, white non-Latino people, and the exposures for the remaining groups are uh, lower. However, this is tremendously different from at RTO to RTO, and I'll be happy to share the results um, uh, on the different RTOs. The disparities by race and ethnicity are observed for each income category, uh, and they indicate that the racial and the ethnic differences hold even after accounting for income differences. The levels of disparity differ by state and the RTO, uh, but nevertheless the exposures are higher for low income than high income, and larger by race than uh, by income. Geographically, we do see uh, large differences on where the electricity is produced and where the effects from the pollution from the electricity generation is suffered. Some states are actually net <coughs> exporters of health damages, whereas others are net importers. For 36 states, most of the health damages attributable to emissions come from other states. And uh, unsurprisingly, most of the impacts are associated uh, with coal rather than other fuels. So once again, we use this marginal approach using the reduced form air quality model. In this case, we're using InMAP as the base case uh, results that I'll be presented. And we use census data, 
with the self-reported race and ethnicity population by block group and household income at the track level uh, from 2014. So jumping on the results, um, our estimate is that over uh, 16 tons of damages in the United States uh, in terms of premature deaths uh, are due to the electricity generation. This amounts roughly for four deaths per terawatt hour of electricity generation. 85% of those are attributed to electricity generating units that are between the RTOs. 90% uh, of the premature deaths are due to coal electricity production. Here in table uh, one and in the figure next to it, I show a little bit of information regarding the RTO results. The figure on the right shows the boundaries uh, of the RTO delimitations, and um, we also highlight the percentage of coal that uh, is still part of the mix in each of those uh, regions. Um, in, in the table on the left, I'm showing both the RTOs, the annual net generation of electricity, followed by the total deaths and the deaths per terawatt hour. Importantly, two regions, MISO and PJM, correspond to a very large number of premature mortality from air pollution and a very high uh, intensity factor in deaths per terawatt hour. Um, SPP also has a high intensity value. Now, thinking about the results by uh, race and ethnicity, uh, the vertical axis is showing the deaths per uh, 100,000 people due to electric generation unit activities. The horizontal axis is showing the self-identified race and ethnicity. Um, on average across US population, we see a number of uh, five deaths per uh, 100,000 people. Now, there is an important distribution um, uh, by race. So we do see that people that self-identify as African-American black people have uh, a larger number of deaths than the average, and so do white uh, non-Latino. Again, this is very different from region to region, but the next level that I would like to show is what this looks like for different uh, household income groups. Um, again, the vertical axis is number of deaths per 100,000 people, and you'll see circles corresponding to the amount of people that we have in different income segments popping up. These dashed lines correspond to the average effect across the US population. And here is the observation of what happens for different race and ethnicity. So we see that all across uh, the board and for all income levels, uh, the effects for African American are larger than uh, for any other segment. Now, that's race and ethnicity and by income is one dimension of distributional effects. I'm jumping now to a whole different level of distributional effects, which is looking at the damages that are faced by states uh, imported or exported by the states. So this first plot shows the annual number of premature mortalities in the state regardless of where the emissions occur. And we see some states like Pennsylvania State, uh, uh, Texas, and Ohio with very large numbers of premature mortality. Now, plot B is kind of self-harm. So it's the number of premature mortalities that you have in the state that are due to emissions occurring in that same state. And we see that places like Pennsylvania <coughs> and Ohio still have large numbers, but substantially smaller than in the first plot meaning a lot of the deaths incurred in those states actually come from neighboring states. Um, finally, in C, we're showing the damage to others. So the amount of um, a premature mortality caused uh, by a state in any place uh, across the United States. And uh, we do see that the two states, for example, Pennsylvania and Ohio, still have large numbers. And finally, we uh, make the computation of the net health damages. So here it's really not good to be in a state where um, the color is red. It does mean that you're not polluting a lot, but you're receiving an enormous amount of damage from other places and your state is suffering from that. This is just a way to look at the same information, but now just plotted uh, for, for easiness, given that the maps may not be as easy uh, uh, to look at. The first one provides the total deaths suffering in the state regardless of the origin. The second one, the total um, pr premature mortality caused by plants in a state, whether that's uh, 
inside the state, that's in black, or outside the state, in uh, orange. And finally, whether a state is a net a damage importer or exporter. I'll just jump in. So some of the key findings, we do find that we don't all breathe the same air and that the consequences are different in different regions and for different segments of the population. Uh, that disparities hold even when we control for uh, income. Um, we also see that those differences um, change from RTO to RTO, but that the thing that one thing that holds is that the differences in race are larger than those by income. Uh, we do observe large differences on where the electricity is generated and uh, where the impacts are suffered, and that for 36 states, most of the health impacts from come from elsewhere. Um, I'll move on to the last, and this is going to be a very short uh, version, but in this p uh, um, piece, which is currently in the review, we look at this issue of whether there are um, trade-offs or co-benefits when we think about the problem of air pollution and the problem of climate change, when we're thinking about investing in um, sustainable transportation technologies. And this is work uh, done in collaboration with Fan Tong. Uh, Fan is a former a PhD student who is, uh, who is now at LBNL. So the transportation sector has recently surpassed um, other sectors in terms of being the largest contributor to CO2 emissions in the United States. It is also the largest contributor to NOx and CO emissions and a very large contributor to some other criteria pollutants. The NRC has found uh, that on-road vehicles altogether account for $110 billion uh, in climate change and air pollution damages. This was back in 2005. Uh, Traffic-related uh, pollution accounts for about 20% of that's from uh, PM 2.5, and on-road vehicles cause about the same level of climate damages, so similar magnitude. So we provide a specially explicit county-level assessment of climate change and air pollution. And the question here is, if we look just at air pollution, if we look just at climate, or if we look at both issues, do we get the same uh, answer? Or would we be in incentivizing different technologies? So we use a life cycle uh, approach at the county level for five fuel pathways and different types of representative vehicles. So in terms of GEGs, we include CO2, uh, um, CH4, oops, um, and N2O. We could consider criteria pollutants different type of fuel pathways and vehicle uh, technologies. For um, the results of for today, I'll just show the results for passengers, SUVs, and uh, transit buses for, for sake of time. So the functional unit for the life cycle assessment is sense of damage, let that be air pollution or climate change, per VMT. And we use a reference here at 2014. So when, when I say we look at life cycle assessment, I really mean that both for the fuels, for the vehicle uh, manufacturing and the battery production, we look at the emissions, both of GHGs and criteria pollutants, all the way from resource extraction uh, to the vehicle. And uh, so we match the types of technologies that we have available and that are likely to be used with the fuel pathways uh, that, um, that would be used. So for example, for transit buses, we consider diesel and CNG. We really don't uh, consider conventional uh, gasoline. Now for the electricity emissions and related damages, we do the analysis at the NERC regional level, and I just show a map of the NERC regions below so that you have a sense. That actually has a tremendous influence on the results, the way we parse out the, the grid and the electricity sector. Once again, for the air pollution, we use the um, uh, air quality model. In this case, the results presented are for easier. For the greenhouse gas emissions damages, we use the social cost of carbon. Uh, for the base case, we use $36 per uh, ton of CO2 in 2007 dollars. We do a sensitivity analysis that ranges all the way from zero to over 100. And we use the 100-year global warming potential for other GHGs. Now, this is the summary for different vehicle types and for different te technologies of the damages weighted by county population, where in the third column, um, you have the cents per vehicle mile traveled if you look only at the climate change consequences. Next, you have uh, the damages if you look at air pollution consequences. And finally, the addition of both when you look at both climate change and air pollution consequences together. Now, if as a policymaker you just care about climate change for passenger cars, um, on average and for the distribution, you think that battery electric vehicles would be the way to go. 
If as a policy uh, maker you care about air pollution, you think that gasoline hybrids, electric vehicles would be the technology that should be incentivized. And again, if you look at climate change and air pollution, um, that would be the gasoline hybrids, electric vehicles. So looking at those different uh, policy aspects is really gonna matter. So we're gonna compare the results both in terms of uh, vehicle fuel technologies, in terms of their life cycle damages uh, for the same vehicle type uh, in the same county. Uh, so in the next figure, what you'll see popping up uh, is the preferred uh, fuel and vehicle combination with the lowest life cycle damages if we look just at climate change, air pollution, or climate change and air pollution. So we'll see the first row populating in a little bit with the car uh, consequences, first for climate change, air pollution, climate change and air pollution, then SUVs and finally transit uh, buses. So this is what the map is gonna look like. Let me just increase this so that it's more feasible. So the color coding represents the fuel slash technology that you would use. So you'd see that uh, for much of the West, you'd even with the 2014 grid average numbers, uh, you'd use a, a, a battery electric vehicle um, if you only care about climate change. And then there are some regions that are light or dark red where you'd go with the gasoline hybrid electric vehicle. Now, the, the uh, map being darker or lighter in color represents the relative difference between the best technology in terms of lowering the damages and the second best. This is just to illustrate whether the results are gonna be robust. So we do see, we would like to see a very dark uh, blue or, or dark red to make sure that what we're saying is the best solution in terms of health um, damages, climate change damages in this case or both, uh, don't change quickly. So if it's very light, it means that there is a less than 10% difference uh, between two technologies or fuel pathways. And this is uh, what this looks like for um, the different uh, technologies and fuel pathways across the country. Now, I'll only talk briefly about uh, uh, this portion, but interestingly enough, there are some regions across the country where you have co-benefits or, uh, or robust decisions. Uh, so in the western part, we do see that uh, even with the 2014 average grid battery electric vehicles um, um, would be the solution whether you care just about climate change, just air pollution, or you actually account for both things as you should. But in other regions across the country, uh, the decision would change. And so you have trade-offs if, as a policymaker, you look just at one versus all together. I promised you a sensitivity analysis in particular for those of you that like to have long debates about the social cost of carbon. So here it is. In the first row shows the fraction of the US population that would select one technology or another as we change the social cost of carbon from zero to 100. And we see that that really doesn't make too much of a difference for passenger cars or SUVs. It does make a difference in transit bus. Um, Below, we have the same type of sensitivity analysis, which technology would you choose by a fraction of US population, but as a function of your assumption about the value of statistical life. Uh, and again, we see that that does make quite a bit of a difference for transit buses. Um, so how do we extract overall information from the plots presented below? Well, for passenger cars, our results suggest that BEVs would be the best solution with the 2014 average grid. Now I'll say a little bit about the uncertainty on that in a few minutes, um, as well as in New England. And so in there we have co-benefits and we know that that would be the best solution, whether you look at climate, air pollution or both. But in most of the other regions, uh, you're looking at trade-offs if as a decision maker or policy maker, you just look at one portion of the problem versus the system and looking at both consequences. Uh, we looked at how the results change under the assumption of using marginal emissions factors at a different type of day. Uh, the key message is that as the grid gets cleaner, then the solution tends to electrify. And uh, of course, those results are uh, also be dependent on several other things that we didn't capture in those images. Uh, in addition to the grid emissions factor and the air quality model being used, we have uh, issues like what time of day is the vehicle being charged? And I know that there is active research um, in, in those areas. So it would be great to see analysis and scenarios by others. Also, uh, we're also working on that, looking at the robustness of the results. And we're currently working on a sister paper looking at the same effects, but for corridors, for medium and heavy duty vehicles. So 
Today, um, we looked at three things, really. The damages from the US economy, a deep dive on the distributional effects uh, from the electricity sector, and finally, the con consequences of different transportation technologies uh, in the United States. Um, I'm really eager to start uh, both continuing, actually, on working in those areas and expanding to areas with the colleagues and students here at Stanford. And uh, with that said, I'll end saying that first I'm teaching in the winter quarter, so welcome uh, to my class if you want to attend it. And the second one that I'll be recruiting postdocs and PhD students, so let me know if you're planning on applying for programs. Thank you. So much information and so many insights. I, I wouldn't know where to start, so I'll leave it to the students to figure out where to start. <laughs> Back there. Yep. So, uh, concerning uh, one of the key findings of the research, which was uh, farm damages are larger than utility damages, I was just wondering uh, what role do you think there is for trying to reduce uh, emissions in the cultural trend? towards uh, a plant-based diet, I mean, like eating less meat. Uh, do you think this might be perceived by the industry, uh, agricultural industry, or it is, is this irrelevant in terms of policy? So uh, the question was really whether uh, our results suggest moving uh, towards a plant-based diet. Um, I wouldn't necessarily go there and, and, and go in that route. We do see that those effects at the margin is that the, the, the damages from air pollution are larger than the value added. What this calls for is, is really thinking about a set of policies or incentives that would decrease a little bit the damages, at least up to a point where the marginal damages equal the marginal benefit that we're getting from those solutions. Now, the perspective that we're taking in this analysis is still quite restrictive, right? Because of course, we don't want to go without food <laughs> overnight. And so there is also all the issue of basic necessities. So keep on reiterating that we're looking at all of this at the margin and uh, more than anything else, it is a call for policymakers to now look at whether it is cost effective to look at those sectors. And if so, to start thinking about a way to deploy the right set of mechanisms uh, to internalize the effects that we're seeing from air pollution in those sectors. Um, have you done any work looking into the policy attribution associated with the utility reductions in PNG? Can you say more to the policy attribution? Um, like attributing, I mean, is it, is it, you said primarily coal, <laughs> closing down, but I'm curious on the perspective. Yes, so actually, um, I was talking with Jim about that the other, the other day. We can, we haven't, but we could actually. So we, we you could and understand how much of the damages decline comes from coal power plants that are still operating. Uh, we can look at how, which one of those uh, coal power plants actually shut down. Uh, we can look at the uptake of natural gas and increase in emissions. So we could do a deep dive doing so. That's a good question. Yeah. There is one there. Um, so I was wondering for the for the last paper about the the different kinds of vehicles. How did you localize things like the manufacturing effect of like battery vehicles, for example? Like, would they have to be like manufactured in the West and then used in the West for it to be? Great question. Uh, no, it's a national average. Actually, that opens up, and that's something that we're looking into right now, the implicit assumption, for example, for battery manufacturing is that it will be done here in the United States. And that's not the case. So we're actually overestimating the damages associated with uh, battery production. Uh, and, and that's actually a substantial part um, of, of the overall life cycle emissions. So things like the electricity generation were site specific. Other things were actually national averages. Uh, and I'll be happy to send you the, the long supplemental information where we tabulate which of those are regional, national, and so on, yeah. Uh, I wanted to know your opinion about bio biofuel and the consequences on the agriculture and the transportation. Um, the question? So the question is thinking about biofuels and the consequences of biofuels for transportation versus agriculture? 
uh, that's it. Um, yeah, so I think the short answer is that I've not looked into it, but that's a great next, that others have, but that's a great uh, research pace actually, both on um, not only the trade-offs between the sectors, the allocation of emissions, but the whole entire thing about how do you account for GHGs actually. So yeah, that opens up a can of worms, but yeah, super interesting. <laughs> The second question you talked about how um, how race played a strong factor in the in the deaths for in the deaths due to pollution rather than uh, rather than economic collapse. So could you if the only factor that goes into that like the communities in which they live, or is there other factors? And if so, like what are a few? Yeah. So we we so the the question is in the second paper uh, we do see an effect. Uh, uh, by race on damages, whether that's attributed to just location where p uh, people live or other factors. Um, so we didn't look at the attribution specifically for different things, but um, a large portion of this is really combining the fact that there are locations where you have uh, predom predominant uh, uh, numbers of ethnicity and race and coal power plants close to that. And so that's more prevalent in some RTOs than in others, yeah. Um, do you plan on studying this kind of issues more internationally? Do you oh, thinking about things? Yeah, because you were talking about yes. batteries, of course it's not made in the US, but it's made somewhere else. Yeah, <coughs> that's absolutely great that you brought it up. Um, one of the um, big directions in terms of research agenda that I would like to push in the next few years is looking at distributional effects from climate change and air pollution, in particular in the context of India and China, given the predominance of the effects. Yeah. yeah. So in your first paper, uh, you showed that petroleum products had a very low uh, damage to benefit ratio. Does that include the burning of, of uh, like, say, the gasoline? Like no, that's included in the transportation. But like the damage is also included, like just burning or not, not really just producing. Producing, and if there is any combustion throughout, it is included. The use in the vehicle, that's accounted for in the transportation. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to take uh, three more. One here, since you have to fill in that over there. Okay. In the third paper, why did you decide to focus on the north regions rather than like the RTO? Right, so, so actually use that in the base results, but again, in the very, very long SI, then we do it at state level, RTO, E-grids, so we tend to include all of this in trying to summarize whether the uh, conclusions are robust across all different uh, ways to characterize the power sector, yeah. First uh, paper, when you show the picture of GED of different sectors, uh, I noticed that ma the four major contributor sectors are all declining from 2008 to 2014, but there is a significant upward in the all other sectors from 2011 to 2014. Have you looked into what are the driving forces for that upwards and any policy suggestions or comments on that? Yeah, we think that what that may be representing is actually a little bit on the aftermath of the recession and then bouncing back up. Yeah. What are your thoughts or opinions on the use of nuclear energy in terms of the economic benefits? Um, so I tend to be technology agnostic. And I do think, do think that if nuclear can help us get to uh, decarbonized and low level of pollution uh, world um, at the reasonable cost, it shouldn't be taken out of the mix. We need everything that we can get, so it should be considered as a part of a portfolio. Yeah. 